Well, good afternoon, everyone. It's lovely to see you. We've been looking at some lovely photographs. I just wonder whether any of those hairstyles will ever come back. We'll have to wait and see. I'm going to ask Penny just to come up and read uh, those words of introduction on the beginning of your program. Thank you. Good afternoon. This service is a celebration of and thanksgiving for the life of Alistair McCann. He was a much loved husband, dad and granddad, a brother, brother-in-law and an uncle. He was a son, a nephew, a cousin, a Sunday school teacher a fellow church member, an elder, a preacher, and church treasurer. Alistair was a friend, a work colleague, and a volunteer treasurer for a charity. But in whatever capacity you knew him, we're all here to remember him and to give thanks to God for his life. The, uh, the family are extremely pleased to see you all here this afternoon and uh, they've asked me to expressly express those thanks. So I'm going to read what they've given me. Rosemary and the family would love to extend their thanks to so many people. Firstly, they would like to thank all those who have sent their condolences to them, offered up prayers both before and after Alistair's death. They are grateful for those who have already contributed in various ways, namely A.H. Fremantle, the fun funeral directors, Maureen and Iris, who've put together the refreshments, and the ladies that have put together the, the flower arrangements. And uh, they also appreciate those that are helping during the service, namely Penny, Dave, Paul, Gordon, Stewart, and Naomi. And lastly, they want to thank all those who have either come to the church to support them today or are watching online from their homes. It's great to have so many family and friends with us to celebrate Alistair, especially those who have traveled a long way to be here today. As I uh, look around the church, I see faces from nearby I see faces further afield and I've got to say I see faces from my misspent youth would that be right <laughs> you see Alistair and Rosie together with many of us were privileged to be part of a great young people's work here at DRC in the 1970s and looking back, it was a time when we grew as Christians. Many of us met our partners. But, of all, but above all, we had great fun together. I think when a bank holiday came, we would get out the old cars and we'd either head to the New Forest or we would go up to Thruxton to the motor car racing. And I can remember on one occasion, Alistair had a... Was it a standard eight or a standard ten? I'm not quite sure. It was a grey car. And he was in front of me. And we were somewhere up Wickham, Blind Lane. Now, that gives you a clue, all right? Because, <laughs> because Alistair was putting his foot down, all right? And he went round the bend. And I, I really thought he was going to lose it. I really thought he was going to roll it. Um, that was the only time that I saw Alistair out of control. <laughs> Which is good, isn't it? But it is a day of sadness. We do rejoice with those who rejoice, but today is a day that we mourn. And because I think it's of that age, I mean, I normally take funerals 
of people that are a lot older than myself, but it's surprising now the number of people that are my age. And I think it proves to all of us that life is transient. And James, the brother of our Lord, puts it like this. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little, then vanishes away. And that becomes so relevant when we meet on occasions like this. Yes, today we are missing a very gracious man, a person of integrity and faith. And yes, we prayed much for Alistair's healing, and yet the Lord has chosen to take him home. But we believe in a God of love and mercy whose ways are past finding out. Alistair has entered his heavenly mansion. All the cares and sorrows of life for him are over. And he is safe, safe in the arms of Jesus forever. Of course, our thoughts and prayers are for you, Rosie, and for David and Alison and your families and your extended families. But now we're going to give thanks and we're going to remember the life of service Alistair lived amongst us. Perhaps there'll be tears of joy and tears of sadness. But at the end of the day, it is God who we will give the praise and all the glory for the great things he has done. I'm going to ask Paul now to come up and open in prayer. Thank you, Paul. Shall we pray? Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for enabling us to gather here this afternoon to worship you and celebrate the life of Alistair, who you have called into your presence. Father, fill this Thanksgiving service with your presence. Let your light shine upon our hearts, even though we are finding it hard to accept what has happened. We know that everything works together for good. Give us the peace that surpasses all understanding as we start this Thanksgiving service. We are reminded that this earth is not our home. We are just passing through. And Father, I am reminded, as Martin has already said, as young people here at Duncan Road, with Alistair and Rosie and others, we used to sing the words of Paul from youth praise, for me to live is Christ, to die is gain. Help us to remember that although we are separated for a time, we will rejoice one day when we stand together in your presence. Father, we pray now that you will be uh, a special comfort and care for those that feel the greatest loss. For we ask it in your precious name. Amen. Thank you, Paul. Well, you'll see from your sheet we've got some lovely hymns. We've got some fairly modern hymns. But the first hymn uh, is quite an old hymn. And I can guarantee, I don't know whether... You are those people who keep these sort of programs in a box, whether it's wedding, funerals, or whatever. Uh, we do, and I can guarantee if you went back um, in the 40s, 50s, 60s, and 70s, and probably even the 80s, the first hymn that we were going to sing would almost guarantee would be on that service sheet, because it was a hymn of testimony all the way my Saviour leads me, what have I to ask beside? Can I doubt his tender mercy, who through life has been my guide? Let's stand to sing. Thank you. 
Thank you. I'm now going to ask Stuart to come up and uh, give us the reading. You'll find it's in your program. Thank you, Stuart. John chapter 11, verses 20 to 27, and then continuing on at verse 32. Verse 20. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed at home. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died, but I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies, and whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she told him. I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who was to come into the world. Now continuing at verse 32. When Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him? He asked. Come and see, Lord, they replied. Jesus wept. Then the Jews said, see how he loved him. Thank you, Stuart. We're now going to have uh, the family appreciations. And Rosie, you're first. <laughs> Are you okay? <laughs> and then the others will follow on. Thank you. I'm not quite sure how much of my beginning part that Douglas might pick up on. Um, obviously, I wasn't around when Alistair was born, because he was up in Scotland, but anyway. So, Alistair was born in Glasgow in April 1951. Two years later, his brother Douglas was born, and then in 1960, another brother, Ian. Their father was a mechanical engineer who, in 1961, was transferred from his job in Glasgow to one in Portsmouth, so the family moved south, where their sister Elizabeth was born. While they lived in Portsmouth, the family attended Paul's Grove Gospel Hall. I first knew Alistair when the family moved house from Portsmouth to Locks Heath, and they started attending Swanwick Gospel Hall, which is what the old building on this site was called in those days. His father was very much involved in the actual construction of this present church building. We eventually became a couple and after several years married in 1974. Alistair's work has always been in finance and accounting. At first he was working as an article clerk in an accountant's firm in Park Gate and studying for his accountancy exams in his own time. He qualified as a chartered accountant in 1976, and our daughter Alison was born in November of that year. After a while, he moved to a new job as an internal auditor with Southern Electricity Board in the Portsmouth area, until in 1978, he accepted a similar post in their Reading offices, which was when we left Parkgate and moved to live in Bracknell in Berkshire. Promotion came along not long afterwards with another job, still in finance and auditing and with SEB, but in their Oxford offices. David was born in October 1979, and then three weeks later, we moved house to Kidlington near Oxford. After several years with Southern Electricity, Alistair changed direction slightly, went to work for British Cable Services a cable television company owned by the infamous Robert Maxwell. When Maxwell died, Alistair with four other men undertook a management buyout and he became finance director of the newly formed Metro Cable TV. After nine years, his role there finished when they sold the company. By then, both Alison and David were young adults and not living at home anymore. So in 2001, we decided the time had come to move back to Hampshire and we bought our house at Leon, Slo Leon the Solent. 
Alistair was too young to retire, so he accepted a job as finance manager with a charity, Tall Ships Youth Trust, who ran sailing ships holidays for disadvantaged young people. He stayed in that job for seven years. No, six years, I beg your pardon. Stayed in that job for six years. It might have seemed like seven years to him. <laughs> he wanted to ease into retirement gradually with a less stressful job, so he left Tall Ships and then worked in two local primary schools as finance officer, one in the morning, then home for lunch, before back to the other school in the afternoon. It meant that he didn't have to work in school holidays, which was great, as we then had more time for holidays in our caravan. In 2015, he took our early retirement. After that, we enjoyed spending more time together and being involved in more of the church activities. Last year, we moved into our new flat at Salisbury Green, which brought our life together round full circle to living just a road away from our first home after we got married. Alistair's faith was a central part of who he was. His parents were both Christians and brought their children up in a home where God was honoured and loved. He committed his life to Christ when he was young and he was baptised in January 60, 1967 along with several others of, others of us here today who were teenagers at that time and he became a member of the fellowship. There were many of the older ones in the church then who encouraged him to develop the gifts he had to teach in the Sunday school or to gain experience in speaking from the platform. He was always grateful for their interest and help. After we moved away from this area, we joined churches first at Bracknell for a short time and then at North Lee in Oxfordshire, where we were members for 22 years. When we moved back down to this area again, we came back to what we always felt was our home church. Wherever we have been, Alistair has taken an active part in that particular fellowship. Back here at Duncan Road, he became involved with senior citizens' teas, lunch and meat and Tuesday tea breaks, helped at the children's holiday clubs, was one of the Sunday Explorers group leaders, and began the Saturday Who Let the Dads Out mornings. He was a preacher, an elder and church treasurer. Whatever he did, he did to the best of his ability and for the Lord. Throughout the 49 years we were married, he was always a loving, caring, and faithful husband. He was proud of both our children and loved them dearly. He welcomed a son-in-law and a daughter-in-law into our family. Each one of our eight grandchildren was much loved too, and they brought in great joy. He didn't find it easy to speak about or show his emotions in a physical way, but he expressed his love in practical ways and in his generosity. I loved him very much, and I will miss him such a lot. Thank you, Rosemary. Uh, I thank you all again. Just want to say from the family for coming today. It is an appreciation of Alistair, uh, and I know he would have been a different person than perhaps the one that I met, because I'm number two. I'm his brother. Uh, there's also Ian and Elizabeth, but we'll come on to those later on. So I wanted to show you some older photographs, because I know most of you will have known Alistair in his, shall we say, later years, perhaps a little bit more serious. But perhaps I want to show you some of the things we got up to when we were slightly younger. There was two years between us, and we were born in the early 50s and brought up in Glasgow. Not the best place to be brought up in. But our parents both came from large families. I'm talking about my mother had uh, 11 sisters and brothers. So that's the size of the number of cousins that we have. And we have one of our cousins actually come down from Scotland today. But one of my earliest memories was actually sitting in a hospital waiting room. Alistair had had a, a childhood injection and it had some kind of adverse reaction and he actually developed very bad eczema. So that was my first memory of Alistair. But as usual, there was the usual uh, sibling rivalries. When we moved to a place in Glasgow called Cran Hill, uh, not the best place to live now, I understand, but it was pretty good in those days. There was always a battle for the ice cream van when it came round. Because uh, you had to sh 
go to your flat, shout up to your mum on the second floor because you didn't want to run all the way up the stairs, and she would throw down threepence. Um, I don't know how many of you know what threepence is. It's, it's about one and a half p nowadays, and it used to buy you an ice cream cornet. But there was always a race to catch the first one, and, and that was between Alistair and I. So sometimes it was, it's equal. But money still comes into other aspects of our lives, because in Scotland, and in Cranhill particularly, whenever there was a wedding, the bride's father actually had to organise a scramble. Now, a scramble is where the bride's father throws coins out of the wedding car for all the kids in the street to actually get some money. So you can imagine, with a whole street full of kids, and with Alistair and I, there was a bit of a fight going on. But this is really where I think Alistair's need for money actually came in. But um, this is, this is uh, my mother and Alistair when he was a baby, so it'll give you an idea as to where we're at. And here he is, surrounded by women, I'm afraid. Uh, this is our cousins. Uh, one of those is actually living in Australia, and she may be watching on the, the link. But this was really Alistair on holiday. We used to go to places called Sawcoats and Dunbar. So you can see he was actually re getting ready for the tall ships job that he was going to have. <laughs> Um, sorry, most of these photographs are in black and white. They were actually taken before colour was invented. Uh, but in the early 60s, mum and dad took a huge leap of faith uh, as Ian had just arrived, and we all moved, moved down to Polesgrove in Portsmouth. This is us four here. Uh, again, apologies to the family, because the sticky out ears is a family trait. But this is us when uh, we moved first to Paulsgrove. This was a time when there was before motorways, uh, and we didn't even have a phone because we couldn't afford it. Uh, so it made it very difficult to keep contact with our relations in Scotland. So that it did cause a bit of a rift within the family, not an adverse rift, but just uh, there was a break and we didn't perhaps keep in touch with them as much as we should have done. But the first thing that Alice and I had to learn was how to lose our Scottish accents because at school, they didn't go down very well. But we're told that we still sometimes occasionally go into them. So you'll have to watch out for any words that come out. <coughs> Our sister Elizabeth came along as, she, as a baby. Uh, she was the first Sassanac. There's a Scottish word for you. A Sassanac is someone that isn't born in Scotland. So she was the first Sassanac uh, in our family. Uh, and she was a girl, so she was another odd one out as well. But we all attended. Whoa! But we then moved when Elizabeth, just before Elizabeth was born to, or just after Elizabeth was born to Swanwick, and we lived in Richards Close in Locks Road. Uh, and this is the Gospel Hall you see. It's a wonderful collection of people there. We used to come. It was just a tin shed at this time, but it was here that we grew up and came to know the Lord. There was a big group, youth group at the time, as Martin's mentioned, and the church really encourages in all our Christian development. As you can see, this is a youth group. Uh, wonderful collection of hats, <laughs> because that was what everybody had to wear at that time. Well, the ladies, anyway. But we actually went to Sunday school. We were really brought up. Sunday school, Bible class. YSL at Mr. and Mrs. News House. Uh, and we even had lessons in homiletics. Now, homiletics, for those that you don't know, is the art of preaching. And the first lesson is, learned, is not to have too many pieces of paper on your, on your lectern. But these were the things that, how, this is how this church actually developed. And it's good to see that it's still here. Although you still have that crack down the wall. I think, <laughs> I think we've had three or four goes at it. It's when I was here to try and get rid of it. Yeah, they, well, they took the curtain away, which I was dead Oh, to. right. <laughs> I'm sure that wasn't the bit that I did. <laughs> but uh, one of the things we also went to was the Hanson Dorset Christian Youth Camps that were held at Corfe Castle. I think that's where Alistair got his love of uh, camping, and particularly his outdoor living and living in a caravan. It's something I never quite understood, but it's something it obviously got to him. We seem to do a lot of eating at the church, and there's Alistair right in the middle there. 
Some of these pictures, you may be a case of Hunt the Alistair, but uh, this is the church. You see, there's quite a crowd of us at the church. I don't know if that's because it was all a sort of close fellowship, or perhaps it was something to do with the, uh, the church ladies put on such a good spread. I, I can say church ladies, can I? That, I'm not sure if that's a sexist thing, but anyway. Alistair went to grammar school. We went to Price's Grammar School in Fareham, and there you can see him in his uniform. I then followed him later, and Ian as well. Of course, we never actually went together because he was older, so he would never sit with us, and I would never sit with Ian, so we would never actually get on the bus together unless we really had to. But I did have teachers asking me all the time why I wasn't more like my brother. But he got his own back because he even got me marching. Uh, at the school we were at, there was a cadet force. He became a sergeant, of course. I was left as a humble private. So he had to teach me to, to march. He got to go on a school's Mediterranean cruise. I got to go skiing, but managed to break both my legs. <laughs> Much to Alistair's amusement. We had Saturday jobs. Uh, he got a job, a cushy job working at my dad's factory in CNAs, which is another old name that you might, not, you might remember, at the CNA factory in Portsmouth. I drew the short straw and had to get a job delivering newspapers uh, down Locks Road. Now, that might sound an easy job now, but in those days, it hadn't been tarmacked. And there were some very, very big houses with some very, very long drives. Uh, but anyway, he, after a couple of years, he actually got me a job at the CNA factory and I got a pay rise up to 25 shillings a day. 25 shillings is £1.25 for the day's work. And I had to pay my own fare out of that. But that was a big pay rise in those days. Alistair was hoping to study French at university, so Dad decided to take us to France. And here we are in our really posh car. No SUVs in those days. No air conditioning. No seat belts. So it was six up. In the, in the hot sun. Um, when we broke down, of course, Alistair's French failed him. And Dad resorted to the English way of shouting and hand gestures before we could get back on the way again. But we did have a good time there. As you can see, that's why Rosemary chose Alistair and not me. <laughs> Mr. Muscles. But we did enjoy the trip. He did, he start, as Rosemary said, he started working as an accountant, but he wasn't a typical accountant, having an interest in a Christian rock band, teaching himself to play the drums. The band was called Something Else Entirely. Uh, I only saw them once, unfortunately, when, and that was when Alistair managed to drop his drumstick. But I think that was quite a, a frequent occurrence. But all credit to him for doing something out of his comfort zone, because he didn't do it for himself, he did it for the Lord, so he could actually teach more and spread the word of God more. <coughs> I did look for some rock memorabilia on eBay, and I'm afraid I couldn't find it. But, anyway. but I think preaching and teaching was one of his loves. And this is, to me, a typical picture of Alistair when he's out teaching and preaching. As a family, we probably didn't do enough to get together. I know all families tend to sort of divide up, we live in all parts, different parts of the country. But Alistair there was always there to offer us wise counsel, both practically and spiritually, as well as prayer support. He was a great example as an older brother, stepping up when we lost our father to become head of the family. He took his responsibilities seriously, especially when it came to looking after our mother in the last few years of her life, which proved very challenging for him personally, as well as the family as a whole. I suppose being the eldest now, I'm now the head of the family. But I have to say, there will be very hard shoes to fill. We thank God for our brother, and know that he can rest in peace. Thank you. I'd like to say a, word, a few words on behalf of my wife, Alison Finch. I find it very difficult to know what to write about my dad. 
not really sure I'm ready for him not to be here. I'm glad I have lots of lovely memories to look back on. I was always a daddy's girl, and I could probably get away with quite a lot of things, although saying that, dad could be quite strict when he needed to be. I never used to like it when he was upset with me. Always wanted to make him happy. He could be impulsive sometimes, and I remember one time when mum was working, he took us to South Sea from our house in North Lee. I've no idea where South Sea is, that must be a mile. It's a long way for one day, and this seemed a very exciting thing to do. I don't remember much about it, but I do what we actually did while we were there, except that Dad didn't bring our coats, and we probably didn't need them. I get told off for that every day as well. <laughs> when I was about 13 or 14, we used to watch a television programme called Quantum Leap. David wasn't old enough to stay up and watch it, so it was something special between me and Dad. We used to sit on the sofa together and watch every episode. I also remember after my A-levels, Dad took me to Paris for a few days. At the time, it seemed very grown up. I don't remember a lot about what we did there, but I know it was a very special time with Dad. He did upset me on one occasion, I can remember, and that was when we were on holiday, one summer holiday, in the caravan, and it was I was made to eat a bowl of custard, and I wasn't allowed to leave the dinner table until I had, and I cried a lot because I didn't like it, and I didn't want to eat it. And I must have eaten it in the end, but the story became legendary within the family and was even mentioned in Dad's speech when I got married. And I still don't like custard. She doesn't. <laughs> Dad always had a strong work ethic. And I remember him telling me that if a job is worth doing, it's worth doing well. This is something I've remembered ever since and, and tried to put into practice in my own life. Once I went to university and moved out, our relationship did change. He always supported me with the choices that I made. Even if him and mum may not always have agreed with them. However, I always knew that he loved me very much. And I was very proud when I became a mum to uh, uh, Amelia and Sam. Love kids. And then Charlotte as well. <coughs> I'm sad he won't be able to see them growing up. But I know he was very proud of all of his grandchildren. Being with him as he passed away was one of the hardest things I've ever had to do. But I'm glad we were able to be there with him. And I take comfort that he knew that we were there with him at the end. I loved him very much and I will miss him greatly. Hello. Do you ever wish you were the oldest child in the family? I find it hard today because now I've got to go after all these emotional things and I thought I was doing quite well. But uh, So anyway, here we go. How would I sum up my dad? Dad was a reliable man. What he attempted, he would do his best at and you could trust his word. He was therefore, I think, a safe pair of hands. And it made him a good accountant. He was thorough, diligent, and accurate. Whatever he said would be well thought through. This served him well in his working life and as an elder here in the church. He wouldn't rush into decisions and would usually play it safe. For someone like me who's more spontaneous, I found that quite hard when I was young. While I'm thankful that he wouldn't let me jump headfirst into all the crazy schemes I dreamt up, Sometimes I would dread hearing the phrase, I don't think that's a very good idea, and would have preferred a slightly more encouraging manner. But that was Dad, not so emotional or empathetic, although I think he softened in his later years. I saw that when he cared for his own mum when she reached the end of her life a few years ago. Still, he was a quiet, private man and kept his thoughts and feelings mostly to himself. I don't really know much about his past because he never wanted to share it with me, or maybe never felt he could. I don't know. I only remember hearing a little about how the move from Scotland affected him in one of his last sermons here at Duncan Road not too long ago. I wonder now how much that experience shaped him. As someone who tends to discuss everything with my wife at length, I have no idea 
therefore how mum and dad made 49 years of marriage work. But they did. Dad was a faithful husband and father. I never doubted his love for mum or for me, even if dad would struggle to show it affectionately or with words. He always provided for us as a family, even there were, were some difficult work times and an uncertain future. He shielded Alison and me from the unsettling time when Maxwell Cable TV came to an end. I was very impressed by him becoming a director. It sounded very grand as a young person. He set a brilliant example to follow in life, work, marriage and family. I'm grateful for the upbringing that Dad led. He faithfully read the Bible to us morning by morning, prayed with us, took us to church each week, and tried to live a life pleasing to God. He was willing to stick by his principles. For example, we were never allowed to watch TV on a Sunday, because that was a day to keep special for God. That wasn't always easy for him to commit to when all the sporting events tended to culminate on a Sunday. But I knew what his position was, whether I liked it or not. He was always involved in church activities and often preached both in the morning ministry times and in the evening gospel services as they were known. I always enjoyed it when he was invited to preach at other churches and I would accompany him and he would ask me to help such as doing the Bible readings for him. It was a good time together although I don't know how aware he was that mainly I was keeping an eye out for any teenage girls in the nearby churches. <coughs> I think Dad struggled to connect with me as I reached my grunting teen stage, funnily enough. Maybe she'd disagree, although, given what she said, uh, uh, but I, I think Dad attended to find Alison easier to get on with with that father-daughter bond. I don't think he had favourites in the slightest, but they perhaps had more in common. Yet Dad did put the effort in with me to keep the door open. I remember our weekly chess games on a Sunday after church where slowly I began to annihilate him, but he graciously kept going anyway. I treasure the memories of our walking trip to the Malvern Hills, and then even a day out to the car show at the Birmingham NEC, even though I was clueless about cars. I'd just like to point out, why did Alison get Paris and I got Birmingham? <laughs> Maybe they were favourites after all. However, Dad was willing to drive across most of France so that we could holiday where the Tour de France was being staged. I get bored driving 10 minutes on the M3 to my office. I have no idea how he spent most of a day and night driving. But that was his servant heart. He might have struggled to tell me that he loved me, but he'd happily come round and mow the lawn that he felt was far too long. Or paint the garage simply because the paint happened to be peeling. He might not be giving me a hug, but he'd instead offer to help pay for car costs or something like that. He was generous with his money and would rather show his love in giving or serving. He was kind and gentle. He spent a lot of time over the years serving with children. He must have been leading Sunday school classes for over four decades. Given that I grew up with that, it felt fairly normal. He was just my dad, but as I hear the comments of others and look back on what he did, it was probably quite unusual. People comment on the way he connected so well with the children in a way others would struggle with, even when he was in his 60s. He would try and reinvent his approach in changing times. For example, purchasing a squeaky parrot puppet, which he would bring to the all-age services. He obviously had a heart for sharing the Christian faith that was so important to him. He took his responsibilities seriously. I remember on one occasion when we were on a Sunday school outing at Birdland in Borton on the Water, one girl reached in a little too far towards the ducks and fell into the pond. Dad was quick to jump to the rescue, despite the rather mucky water, safety first. Being quite conservative in his views, Dad would find it quite hard to change or take a risk but at times he would surprise me in some of his actions. He felt like a hero to me when we first moved to Northley and he took on some sort of role with the Norlai News Village magazine. However, I don't think I ever actually saw him on the moped that he used to drive a few years ago. Despite being such a private man, he set the tone for me and my family by having an open home. Often there would be people from church coming round for a meal or for coffee and any visiting preachers to the church would always be welcome. 
He was happy to be a quiz master at any parties or games organiser. To be honest, I think generally he was happier leading than participating. One of my biggest surprises was when Dad started the Who Let the Dads Out Club that Mum mentioned here at the church for dads with their kids. It was definitely out of his comfort zone, but I was proud of him for being willing to give it a go. While you could trust Dad's words, the same could not be said for his DIY efforts. I think I may have inherited that trait. I remember peacefully sitting watching TV, not on a Sunday of course, only for the next minute to find Dad's leg dangling through the ceiling after he slipped off a beam while working in the loft. Or there was that time when an attempt to stop the floorboard squeaking ended up with water spraying all over the place when he screwed through a pipe. Dad wasn't the healthiest of people, with the chocolate bar wrappers strewn throughout the car as a testament to his sweet tooth. While he played football at some point, and I remember him cycling when I was a boy, I don't recall him doing much in the way of exercise beyond that time. I was kind of surprised that he went so long without much illness. In fact, I hardly remember him being ill besides the common cold. And I think that's why cancer treatment hit him quite hard. I just don't think he really knew how to cope with being ill. He did the best he could, but I'm glad that his suffering is now over and that he's in a far better place. God has blessed me with a good, godly dad. I will miss his wisdom and advice. I will miss his generosity. I'm sad that my children won't get to grow up with his faithful example and that my unborn child won't even have met him. But God is good and he knows what he's doing. And as a family, we can trust him to provide for us without him, just as Dad trusted all the way to the end. Thank you. Grandad knew eight of his grandchildren by name. As the oldest, I've been asked to represent all of them and read a contribution from some of the memories each one has. It's often said that love can be expressed through five languages. These are time, service, words, touch, and gifts. From what I gather, Grandad was never particularly known for sharing love through touch or words. And many of the physical gifts he gave weren't memorable for long. But what stands out for all of us are the many occasions on which he would devote his time to his grandchildren. I'm going to read the contributions from my cousins, Amelia, Sam, and Charlotte first, and then go on to the memories from me and my siblings. This is what they say. We used to go and stay with Grandma and Grandad at their house in Leon the Solent because we don't live near them, and this meant we could spend some time with them. We used to like this because it was fun. Sometimes Grandad could be a bit strict, but mostly he was fun. We remember that he used to fall asleep in his chair a lot, even before he became ill. Amelia remembers making a scrapbook with Grandad, and she still has this today. Sam remembers Grandad's model trains and one time helped him to make a model for his train track. Charlotte remembers going to their house and playing with their toys. Sometimes Grandad helped to make the train track. She remembers lots of cuddles with Grandad on his chair. Grandad enjoyed poetry and literature, and so I've written a poem that shares many of the memories that I and my four siblings, Abigail, Daniel, Joanna and Grace, have of him. Some of the things mentioned you might be able to relate to as well. Friday afternoon's back again, the younger three he'll take. Just because you must remain, it's not all bad, there's cake. Playground trips were routine joys, day trips he loved the best. Trips to London for the boys, milkshakes for the rest. Grandma, are you in yet? That's what we'd always say. As into the car he'd promptly get, and he would wait for nay. The engine he would start while Grandma lingered there, out of the goodness of her heart, helping kids into their chair. But once the buckling up was done, he had no rush at all. Wales or Kent or somewhere fun, he'd drive us past nightfall. The TV was fun or could be a bore. I hated Sean the sheep. A royal event would pass a day or he'd press mute then fall asleep. <laughs> when he thought he saw a need, he'd give aid or advice. Mowing the lawn that's full of weeds, the accounting course that's nice. On a birthday it would be, where would you like to go this year? 
Will it be driving in West Quay or just sleeping in our spare room here? A model railway show? That's fine. I'll come and pick you up. Why don't you come and help with mine? I've just got it set up. Often we would disbelieve how much he tried to feed us. Then, for what we're about to receive, we are truly thankful our men. <laughs> After that, he told us that all he learned at school was eating roast potatoes because he was probably playing the fool. His dozen Bibles he'd read each day to allow him to preach. His love for God led him to pray and explorers he'd also teach. When I saw him last, he said, come in any circumstance. We'd love to make you up a bed. I wish I'd had the chance. No more wibbly hands at all. No napping in his chair. We say to Grandad now, let's roll. His life's much better there. Thank you uh, to the family. I know how difficult it is to uh, recall memories, but as you record memories, I guess most of us who knew Alistair, something sort of lodged in our own brain and uh, a memory came. Um, I don't think he ever lost his Scottish brogue, did he? I don't remember that, but uh, anyway, Gordon's going to come up now and offer up a prayer thanksgiving on behalf of all of us. Well, thank you for allowing me to be part of this occasion. I served with Alistair on the eldership of this church for many years. And if I'm honest, when Alistair was invited on the eldership, I thought, uh oh, we need to make some big changes in this church if we're going to not fizzle out and grow. And I thought Alistair might put the handbrake on, but not at all. The only disagreements I had with Alistair were mainly on a Sunday morning, because I would turn the heat down. And by the time I'd got here, he was in the corner turning it up. So I had to get someone to distract him so that we could turn it down again. So that was the constant battle I don't think we ever won or agreed on. But as an elder, he was a, a pleasure to work with. And Martin and Paul will tell you that. Um, we had many hours and uh, enjoying each other's company, uh, debating, thinking through, and trying to grow Duncan Road Church. My big regret was never seeing the parrot puppet live in action. But who knows? Let me, as I lead us in a short prayer, just read some verses from Philippians, sorry, from Philemon, which I think summarize Alistair. I always thank God for you in my prayers, for I have heard how you love and trust both the Lord Jesus himself and those who believe in him. And I pray that those who share your faith may also share your knowledge of all the good things that believing in Jesus Christ can mean to us. It is your love, my brother, that gives us such comfort and happiness. You have refreshed the hearts of the Lord's people. Let's pray. God of eternal life and love, we give you thanks today for the life and the witness of Alistair. We thank you for the, mem the many memories that we have of him. We all know him in a different way, a different type of relationship, but we thank you for the many happy memories that flood our hearts and our minds. We thank you for his faith and commitment to Jesus Christ, for the way he served here at Duncan Road Church and other church fellowships that have been mentioned. Thank you for his wider influence in this locality as he preached and assisted other church fellowships. Thank you, Lord, for Alistair's life of participation and involvement and the example that he set as to what it means to live and to serve you. We thank you that for Alistair now there is nothing left to fear. No more suffering, no more frailty, no more confusion. We thank you that he is at peace. We rejoice even in our sorrows and our loss because we know that Alistair is with you. He is in the presence of the God he loved and served. We do pray for Rosemary and the family and we ask that you will comfort them at this time. So we ask Lord as we honour his memory, that you will make us aware that you are the God who can give light in times of darkness, who gives peace even in our times of turmoil, who can bring joy in the midst of sadness, and who will provide comfort even in the face of great, great distress. So Lord, hear our prayer, receive our thanks as we bring it in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you, Gordon. I think it's time we stretched our legs and 
sung a hymn together. Let's sing the, the second one on the sheet. My heart is filled with thankfulness to him who bore my pain. and the R's as you look at the next item, address by Martin Fielder. I'm quite happily to skip to the benediction. Do you want to take a vote on that? No? All right. You might think it's strange, the uh, reading that I've taken. <laughs> David's nodding his head. Um, during lockdown, um, I started to read through the Bible. In fact, I went through twice and I recorded each day what I'd written. Now, I don't know why I did this, but on the 21st of November, 2021, I wrote this chapter down and I put in brackets, Alistair. I haven't a clue why I did that. I don't know whether that was a particular date in the, the journey that Alistair took, whether we knew more then, I, I, I don't know. But I thought if I'm ever asked to take his service, that's what I'm going to speak of. Now don't come up to me afterwards and say, what have you got written down for me? Because <laughs> <laughs> honestly, I've got, well, <laughs> I haven't got it. You'll be pleased that I'm not going to give a long message on the raising of Lazarus. Instead, I want to hang my thoughts on just one little word. And it's the word, if. And both Martha and Mary say it. Remember that verse? If you had been here, my brother would not have died. If you had been here, my brother would not have died. Now, before we get there, let me just explain the, concept, the context very quickly. 
The home of Martha, Mary and Lazarus was a very special place which we know Jesus often visited. And Jesus always received a warm welcome. He enjoyed Martha's hospitality, no doubt her cooking, and the friendship both of Mary and Lazarus. And at the beginning of John 11, we read in verse 5, Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. And in the last verse of our reading that Stuart read, it said this, See how he loved him. Do you know, we have no record of Lazarus speaking at all in Scripture. You would have thought when those grave clothes were removed, he would have shouted, Hallelujah! My name is Lazarus. It's good to be alive again. But no. Lazarus was quiet. He was unassuming. But we know one thing. He loved to be in the presence of Jesus. In fact, if we go into the next chapter, we find Lazarus is there, right next to Jesus, enjoying his company at that party given in honor of Jesus. Now, I've known Alistair since the early 60s. And yes, he was quiet, and some of you have said that. He was um, unassuming, unassuming, but he loved to be in the presence of Jesus. And when he did speak, you listened. His speech was always measured and always helpful. And one of the pictures I've got of Alistair on a Sunday morning, when I came into church and nine times out of ten I was on the door, Alistair you know, wouldn't sort of mingle around. He'd come straight down and he'd sit in this second row. And he'd have his Bible on his lap and he'd be reading. Now, whether he's doing the reading for the day, I don't know, but I imagine he was reading what we were going to go through. And he would always welcome the speaker and give him a prayer. He was that sort of man. Let's move on. Jesus loved Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. And yet, in our story, the family. With the family disaster strikes and Lazarus has fallen ill. The sisters send a message to Jesus. Lord, the one you love is sick. What happens? Jesus delays his coming. In fact, when he does arrive, Lazarus has died and the funeral has already taken place four days ago. For Mary and Martha, their world had fallen apart. And no doubt their, their faith has been shattered. And yet as we look at Mary and Martha, they are sisters of contrast. And yet when Jesus finally arrives, they both greet Jesus with the same words. Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. And it's that little word, if, that causes Martha and Mary such grief that Jesus responds to. Oh, what heartache that little word if can bring. If only I'd done better at school. If only I'd passed 11 plus, I would have been at prices with Alistair. If only I'd listened to my parents. If only I'd done what my wife had said. <laughs> When Martha knew that Jesus was coming down the road, she quickly went out to meet him. And I'm trying to think of the way that she might have said it. Would she have been wagging her finger? I don't think so. But she said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. I think there was a, the hint of complaint. And I've said, it's the if of complaint. Have you ever been there? Where were you, Lord, when I needed you? Why didn't you bother to answer my prayers? We're overwhelmed with circumstances, and we doubt even the Lord's presence. And what does the Lord do in that circumstance with Martha? Does he rebuke her? No. He knows her too much. He loves her. 
So what is Jesus' reply? Well, we didn't read it, but it was in the reading before. It says, your brother will rise again. And then Jesus says something, uh, which is quite doctrinal, something that has been quoted in cemeteries, crematorium, and Thanksgiving services like this, down through the centuries. I can guarantee you'll go, you won't go to a funeral, a Christian funeral, and not hear this verse quoted. I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies, and whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this, Martha? We can ask the same question of you. Do I believe it? Do we believe it? Do you know there's tremendous hope in those words, especially for those who have died. I am the one who raises the dead. And for those who are living... If you believe in me, you will never, never die. On Wednesday, the 31st of May, Alistair passed away in the QA hospital. And just a short time ago, we laid his body to rest in Posbrook Cemetery. Alistair died physically, but we know his soul and spirit are with the Lord in paradise, not floating in the atmosphere or anything like that. He is in paradise. He is in heaven. He's with his Lord. And one day, the Lord will step into the air with a loud trumpet blast and Alistair will be given his new body and will enjoy all that God has planned. He will live eternally. Now that's a glorious hope. Martha responded, and I don't quite think she understood everything, but she said, yes, Lord, I believe you are the Christ, the Son of God. I wonder what we would say. That's, that's Martha. Quickly now, let's see how Jesus responds to Mary as she asks exactly the same question. Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. For Martha, it was the if of complaint. If you had been there, where were you, Lord, when I needed you? For Mary, I think it's the if of confusion. If only I could make sense of all this. You said that you love us. You've got a strange way of showing it. I'm confused. I'm perplexed. I'm disappointed. My tears are my only companion. Now, what do you say uh, to a person like that? What did Jesus say? Well, he said absolutely nothing. What did he do? He just wept with her. He just wept with her. Now, we are a mixed congregation this afternoon. And perhaps some of us are like Martha. It's the if of complaint. You're complaining. Why was he taken so soon? Why didn't we get an earlier diagnosis? Things could have been different. Maybe some are like Mary. You're confused. You just don't understand it. Well, I've got good news for all of us. There is hope beyond the grave and for the here and now. He who believes in Jesus Christ will live even though he dies. And who is, whoever is leaving and believes in Jesus Christ will never die. And remember, for those who are weeping, Jesus is weeping with you. Share your tears with him. And scripture says, weeping may remain for a night, but rejoicing comes in the morning. That's really all I want to say. But I've known Rosie all my life, and she has known me all her life. And I just want to just say one thing, Rosie. Whenever we read about Martha, she's always dashing around, she's busy. She's working. It's a life of devoted service. 
Mary, on the other hand, we find is always at the feet of Jesus, a life of devoted worship. But remember, and it's often quoted in this church, the main thing is the plain thing, and the plain thing is the main thing. Rosie, continue working for Jesus like you've done, but remember the secret to work is worship. Thank you. Let's conclude our service of thanksgiving uh, with a hymn by Stuart Townsend. He wrote this because he was wanting to express his views on, on hope. And that comes out really well in the last verse. There is a hope that stands the test of time, that lifts my eyes beyond the be be beckoning grave to see the matchless beauty of a day divine when I behold his face. When sufferings cease and sorrows die and every longing satisfied, then joy unspeakable will flood my soul, for I am truly home. Let's stand to sing. And perhaps after we sung the hymn, just remain standing for the benediction. say the family 
would love you all to stay and chat and enjoy some refreshments. And uh, can we suggest that while you do that, or even if you can't stay for refreshments, you would sign the memory book. We're going to take the flowers down and bring that table up. Uh, so if you have any memories of Alistair, then write them, write them down. It will be something the family can treasure once the day is over. Also on the table are some photo, photos for you to browse. They show some of the key parts of Alistair's life. And we hope you'll enjoy a trip down memory lane. And finally, if you wish to make a charitable donation in memory of Alistair, we are requesting that donations go to Tear Fund, a Christian charity seeking to tackle poverty in some of the world's poorest countries. Well, there's a box at the back of the hall for cash and checks, or you can go online and it's there on the back of the program and you can make your donation there. Thank you once again for coming. Please enjoy chatting to each other, some you haven't seen for ages, no doubt. Let's pray. Almighty God, Father of all mercies and giver of all comfort, deal graciously, we pray, with those who mourn. May they experience that the eternal God is their refuge and underneath are the everlasting arms. Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you.